सेक्रेटरी डॉक्टर दर्शना त्रिवेदी एंड मानसी मेहता एग्जीक्यूटिव कमिटी डॉक्टर संजय राजहंस डॉक्टर सोहन शिलकर डॉक्टर सूरज खान से डॉक्टर राहुल देशमुख एंड डॉक्टर अस्मिता मोहनकर द स्टेट टीम ऑफ आई पी डब्ल्यू सी इनक्लूड स्टेट कोऑर्डिनेटर डॉक्टर सुवर्णा गणवीर जॉइंट कोऑर्डिनेटर डॉक्टर स्नेहल पटेल सब कोऑर्डिनेटर डॉक्टर उत्तरा मोहन डॉक्टर निराली सांगवी एंड डॉक्टर प्रिया करंदे In Maharashtra, IPWC has conducted 40 plus low-cost activities in various districts. In April 2019, first corporate IP conference held in Indore, where Maharashtra state received award for best state IPWC. Now, today we all are fortunate to have an eminent speaker, Dr. Hamza Gautrawala, who is MSc in advanced physiotherapeutic practice pg diploma in cognitive behavioral therapy pg certified in sensory integration scotland his well regarded clinician and expert witness with over 12 years of experience working with complex medical legal cases along with his clinical expertise in various neurological conditions especially spinal cord injuries and acquired brain injuries he is currently involved in large multinational clinical trials across usa and uk addressing stroke rehabilitation through vagal nerve stimulation i welcome you sir on behalf of ipwc uh, pune district and ip maharashtra state now before moving on for the webinar i request all the participant to please mute your microphones so that there will be a smooth running of the webinar and those whoever is having a questions please put it in chat box so at the end of the session we will try to give answers thank you now i request sir to please proceed further very good evening to everyone thank you for uh... taking time off uh, on an evening and uh, choosing to listen to my webinar on coma rehabilitation right can everyone see my screen if i can get the thumbs up from uh, one of the organizers that would be great okay right the the topic itself is uh, quite challenging and daunting for clinicians uh, across a variety of rehab spectrum you will either have nothing to say depending on uh, the neurological insult the client has suffered or at the other hand you will have a lot to say and a lot to do and that will depend on a prognosis which is good for the client so basically coma falls in, under under a wide spectrum of uh, neurological insult nothing to say or a lot to say uh it's it's beyond the scope of, of this one hour webinar to try and cover the entire stimulation programs and details what what i will try and do is spend the first 5 6 minutes uh, just setting up a, a background and uh, making sure everyone is well aroused and then slowly start taking you to a stimulation level and introduce some of the programs uh quite a few programs to go through i will touch base on a few and talk in detail of one particular element uh, cognitive rehab which which is my favorite which is my area of expertise and and try and share some knowledge which which hopefully will help you treat coma patients uh, in, a, in a slightly different way with a slightly different perspective okay to, be, to begin with what we mean by the term coma so on on a, on a simple layman terms you're basically looking at your patient as being unresponsive okay so on the other hand you want to make sure 
that a person is conscious or able to respond. And, and to be able to have that element of consciousness, you're reliant on two major systems in our so your ascending reticular activating system, which is basically the system that keeps you awake. And once you're awake, very important to have a functioning cerebral cortex of both hemispheres, which will determine the content of that consciousness. So it's as good as saying that someone is conscious, but if the content in, in, in a way that he presents doesn't make sense, you're as good as having, having no element of consciousness. Moving on further, Glasgow Coma Scale, very important for us, both from an assessment and a management point of view. So initially, the, the level of the Glasgow Coma Score will determine the level of consciousness and, and present a picture as to which category your patient falls. And as subsequent stages go on, there will be more of an assessment come diagnostic, come prognostic tool. The score goes down, you know, the patient is deteriorating, the score goes higher up in terms of improvement, you know, the patient's recovering. So very important to keep this scale in mind. I'm not gonna go in details, just a teaser, you, you know, three elements, eye opener, verbal and motor response, each of them very important to be assessed in detail, in thoroughly. I'll probably skip this part. This is more, more of the uh, physiology element of uh, uh, a vegetative state compared to the cerebral hemispheres. But something if you guys are interested in and, and someone who works more in this particular environment of ICUs dealing with the comatose patients, a, a very good sort of uh, continuum spectrum to go into detail that gives you the different levels of consciousness as the patient improves. Now, when you're addressing coma patients, first of all, you want to make sure that uh, is the patient actually, you know, diagnosed or labeled with coma. I wouldn't worry too much about this. Leave it to the medical team. Let them diagnose. Let them label the patient coma or, or, or recovering. Our job, irrespective of whether the patient is in coma or not in coma, is rehab. So I, I wouldn't worry on, on that element of making a diagnosis of of the patient is comatose or, or recovering. But just at the back of your mind, when, when you're dealing across such, such a continuum of patients, when you say, you know, the patient is, has gone into coma, they, you just have to have a brief idea saying, okay, when they say the patient is in coma, you're looking at, there is no response with the eyes, there is no sign of wakefulness, and, and there has to be an associated neurological insult for the clinician to be able to make a diagnosis or come across a justification saying the patient is now in coma. At a very basic level, the main thing that should come across your mind is there has to be the environment of the brain stem. So your, your main respiratory centers being compromised and your brain stem being compromised, depending on, on the type of injury. And that could be an indicator that yes, this is the possible reason for coma. There has to be involvement of the brain stem. Now, unfortunately, one third of those patients will die within a month. Now, this is this is what I'm talking about, the, the insult being quite severe and there are no signs of recovery at all. So one third of those patients will, will die. Majority of, of that happens because along with the brain injury or the neurological insult, there tends to be the multi-organ failure setting in. So your lungs, kidneys, so unfortunate for the patient. Now, for the remaining category, the coma status gradually starts resolving. So you're seeing signs of recovery, but that could take a minimum between two to three months in survival. So it, it is quite a big, big period. Uh, you know, even if you take the lower end of two months, two months is still a big period for, for us to be able to then proceed with actual rehab. So just keep these two things in mind that not, not all patients in coma will die, not all patients will recover very quickly. Even today, they will vary across the spectrum. Okay, very quickly. So you will either have the patient presenting with what we call a vegetative state, and this is more the, the lowest sort of uh, site of recovery. No, there is no cognitive awareness. Now, if at all, 
there are signs of improvement. You're seeing what we call a transitional phase. You might see some spontaneous eye opening happening. With that, you will come across sleep wake cycles. So you know that fingers crossed this patient is showing signs of recovery. We might see some, some response happening. But at this stage, you will have no expressions, no behavioral responses to any external stimuli. So you're still on the lower end thinking chances are very dim the patient will recover. Moving on, if there are signs of recovery, the patient will fall into this category, what we call the minimally conscious state. Now, these are some very basic characteristics you will come across when you see a patient recovering with, with the vegetative state. So you will have some elements of intelligible verbalization. You might be able to follow simple commands, more of a yes, no response. And there might be some sort of trigger response to external environmental stimuli. The last element, accommodation to shape and size is variable. I mean, at, at a very basic level, if there's some amount of movement that you see and you try and give an object in, in the hand, you might see the patient adapting to it. If that is a sign you see, good, very good. You, you, you're happy that uh, this patient will make more progress. So that is something you want to keep in mind when you're assessing the patient as a stage. Just go ahead. For the recovery, very quickly, the patient will then fall into the confusional state. So you will have more of an interactive communication which may or may not make sense. More importantly, from a, from a behavioral response, you will either have the patient not speaking at all or you will have an agitated response. Again, cognitive elements will severely be depressed. And majority of cases will have an episode of what we call the amnesia. So they will have no memory or recovery recall of what, what happened. So this period is quite, quite sort of important. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned previously, and very quickly to get a more of an insight, there has to be involvement of the brain stem when you're talking about coma. No, no, no hesitation of that. I'm a big fan of cranial nerves. And I would strongly recommend neurophysios in particular who are in this area. You need to get your cranial nerve testing spot on. No, no sort of hesitation. It hasn't, shouldn't be done without, without an element of doubt, shouldn't be rushed and shouldn't be ignored. Two reasons for that. Number one, just a brief light on the neuroanatomy. So you have your cranial nerve nuclei emerging from the brainstem, majority of them, midbrain, pons, medulla. So following any type of injury which results in a coma, say for example, uh, a traumatic uh, head injury or a person with suicide ending up with a head injury, there's going to be an element of bleeding inside the brain and falling on the simple physiological principle, the brain has no place to expand. So the skull is protected. So the contents of the brain are constantly fighting against each other to make some space, to preserve their space, which ends up in swelling, which ends up in inflammation. And once inflammation sets in, your cranial nerves start getting affected. So cranial nerves will play a very important role right from the beginning in terms of assessment. And as you start the rehab process, as you do the cranial nerve assessment, again, you will see signs of recovery of those cranial nerves. Secondly, what you want to make sure is not rush into a judgment of labeling a particular cranial nerve palsy. Unless it is very obvious that you see a sign of a particular nerve region, you label that, that this particular patient has, for example, the third nerve palsy or the fourth nerve palsy, but do not rush into it. The reason I say that is because if it's just pure inflammation, as the status improves, the inflammation and the surrounding structure will start regaining their original positions in the brain. And so the cranial nerves will also start recovering those functions. So it's, it's, it's important that you do not label that person having a particular cranial nerve palsy. One nerve to keep in mind is a sixth nerve. More than 90% of any neuro cases will show that particular nerve palsy, but that is a false positive. The reason for that is the sixth nerve has a slightly longer route compared to other cranial nerves, except the vagus, which goes up further into the heart and the digestive system. On the other cranial nerves, the abducens nerve has a slightly longer route of exit. 
So you can imagine a brain being inflamed, it can get affected at any part of that abduction no, and it will straight away give you a lateral gaze palsy and you say, oh yes, this person has a six nerve palsy. No, as soon as the inflammation stops, that resumes back to normal. But this is a good prognostic sign for us. And the last bit from the assessment point of view, the doll's eye reflex. And I'm not sure how many of you know what the doll's eye reflex is, but before I just introduce that and give you an idea of that, a word of caution, do not do this on your own, especially if the case is of a cervical injury or more towards a brainstem herniation case. Strongly advise, you want to make sure there is a senior neurology registrar or a consultant when, if at all, they allow you to do the doll's reflex. Because what you're basically doing is, for a normal person, a doll, doll's reflex is when you turn the head to the left, your eyes also go in the same direction. The vestibular and ocular part works together. With the brainstem involvement, what happens is you move your head to the left, the eyes go on the right. So that, that sort of opposite reaction, doll's eye, what we call, straight away you know it's a brainstem involvement, but you want to be very, very, very cautious and not do that. But at the same time, at some point in your life, as, as a physio, as a clinician, you want to make sure you see that reflex. Very important, go to ward rounds, ask a consultant to demonstrate that, and you'll be amazed to see. And that, that is the one secret why, why they label the patient in coma straight away very quickly as well. Doll's eye reflex positive, comatose, brainstem herniation. Okay? Right. Is everyone awake so far? I can see some smiling faces, so that's it, good. Okay, important element for us. So we've, we've done the assessment in terms of a proper, uh, you know, full neurological assessment. And I would put more, more of my emphasis on the cranial nerves. Uh, the reason I mentioned why that's so important. And then, of course, you want to start the rehab rehab journey. That's that's what our our main responsibility is as, as physio. So quite self-explanatory on the side slide here. You will come across what we call the acute stage when the patient is in the ICU, ventilators, multi-organ multi management, gradually as the recovery progresses, they go back into community. And once they're back into community, we have what we call a long-term case management. So depending on the area you work, you, you could be involved in either one of those specialities or all of it if, you, if, you, if you're someone who works across all those spectrums. Now, when, when you start planning your, your rehab goals, you want to make sure you include at least these four elements in, in your protocol or in your management plan. Glasgow Coma Scale, as I mentioned before, assessment, prognostic, diagnostic, very important at all stages. And then there are quite a few different outcome measures, but majority of us prefer these two, and they're, they're quite good. The, the Amigo scale and the JFK coma recovery scale. The, the reason we, we choose this in particular are because these two scales, they work on a hierarchy pattern. So the highest element of that particular outcome score is based more on a cognitive level. And the lower element of that score is based more on the cerebral cortex functioning and the brain stem functioning level. So if you're somewhere in between the score, it gives you a good prognostic level that uh, you know the chances of recovery are very good. And then again, my, my hands-on, my, my bet on cranial nerves, very important. Now, majority of us as, as physios, the, the tendency is to rush into what we call restoring movement, which is fine, which is, which is obvious, uh, and that's what we, we, we need to work on. But, but there is an important element of cognition which is either ignored or, or missed or, or because of a variety of reasons, lack of resources or lack of time, or sometimes even lack of knowledge, this element is not addressed. And, and the key message for, for rehabilitation, in, in our case, in today's topic for coma rehab, or for that matter, any other neuro insult cases, you have to make sure these two are addressed equally. Otherwise, uh, it, it, is, it is hitting a bullseye with your eyes closed, things can get a bit more complicated and messy. I will explain why, why they go hand in hand and the importance of addressing 
in detail as we go across stages. Oh. I think there's someone's uh, mic on. Uh, I can get an echo. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Now, if, if you read the 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 header, the purpose is spent in the other way around. So it's it's basically reading as positioning. You want to make sure the positioning is absolutely right. You get the positioning wrong for a start, and you're not in a good sort of recovery pattern for that patient. Now, this this is more for third year students, and I'm sure experienced clinicians know the importance of positioning. I'm not looking at answers for. Can can you hear me? I'm getting a connection error here. Is that okay? Okay, perfect. So when I mean positioning, I'm not looking for answers saying positioning is important to prevent bed sores, to prevent contractures, to maintain joint range, X, Y, that, that is a uh, standard second year, third year uh, answers for students. The reason why positioning is so important is when you start treating a, a patient uh, recovering from coma, you have to keep in mind you're as good as treating or working with a kid, a newborn newborn kid. So the way you position, the way you treat, the way you introduce things is what is now going to form a new pathway. And hence the importance of getting positioning right. Now, at a very basic level, you're looking for following the rule of 30 degree. Very quickly going to go through three points for that. You want to make sure the head end of the bed is elevated, not more than 30 hips and shoulders in supine at 30, and making sure those are supported with pillows and wedges, whatever available equipment you have at your, at your hospital setting. Now, one, one element of, of uh, you know, importance here is majority of, of, of patients who have who've been in coma, one important fact is also going to be a rise in their, their intracranial pressure. And most of us lie down flat during the night, so will most of these coma patients do, with or without ignorance of the nursing staff to keep their head and elevated. So what tends to happen is nighttime, our venous returns are, are at rest, and eventually when the patient wakes up in the morning, the, the main complaint is nausea and, and, and headache. And uh, as a physio, if you're going to see the patient first thing in the morning, the patient would, would say that, uh, you know, I have a severe headache, that's it, you, you, you make a note in your note saying, patient declined because of headache and you know, therapy doesn't happen. I, at least I used to do that because, because I didn't know the reason, reason behind this. But secondly, I was also very happy during my college days that you know, at least one patient less at this point of time now. So what, what you want to make sure is uh, if you intend to see these patients as part of your rehab, if they've been lying flat throughout the night, instructions to the nursing team that first thing in the morning after they washed and dressed, bed in at 30, so that allows some amount of, of the ICP to settle down and the headache will, will be relatively less. If at all, that's a major complaint. Okay. Then you want to make sure you're doing what we call a slide sheet transfer. Now, the, the, we are still at, a, at an acute stage. The patient hasn't been sitting up or being able to mobilize at all. So we, all, all we're doing is basically doing bed, bed mobility. Now you've got to be very careful and not try and do too much of, of hands-on approach with more of manual handling because you're going to hurt your back. And at the same time, there is already a lot of uh, injury to the patient. So that's, that's not a very good idea. You want to minimize the risk of shear forces at this point of time. So you want to make sure you use slide sheets as a way of positioning the patient. Two reasons. Number one, like I mentioned, reduction of shear forces, important to give what we call comfort care to the patient, as opposed to rough handling with, uh, with our, our hands. And secondly, when, when you start using a slide sheet, you're basically introducing a very small element of sensory stimulation, which is going to play a major role 
in the coming rehab programs of, of coma stimulation. So with, with the person sliding up and down sideways using a slide sheet, you've introduced an amount of kinesthesia and amount of proprioception. And these two sensory systems are very, very important for our sensory stimulation programs in later stages of rehab. And then if you have the luxury, you can use specialized positioning equipment in the forms of wedges and cones and stuff. There's a lot of uh, stuff in the market now these days, highly specialized. The, the, the only problem in, in, a, in, a, in a slightly less resourceful area is with, with pillows. The pillows will not maintain that sort of positioning for long. So that is a, a slightly drawback. So you want to make sure you start introducing wedges and, and, and other, other specialized equipment for positioning. Okay. Let's have a look at the time. I might leave this video in the end. If not, people can always sort of use this link and have a look. This, this video in particular is shows a very basic slide sheet transfer process. The main sort of mechanism is same across coma patients. The only thing that you keep in mind here is minimum three staff required. Two staff doing the maneuvers and the third staff taking care of the surrounding equipment. Less than three, you're, you're inviting a bit of risk to the patient and you do not want to do that. Okay. So now we start moving on to a gradual, more recovery uh, you know, phase. So you want to introduce what we call a sensory stimulation program to these patients. At a very basic level, what you're expecting is some amount of arousal and behavioral response using some stimuli. And you're targeting our main sensory system domains. So your kinesthesia, your proprioceptive, auditory, visual, and, and tactile. Some key features to keep in mind, I'm not going to go into details of how you do a particular sensory stimulation program. Lots of protocols across. And, and, and even for a, for a fresh physio who's just passed out, you're basically looking at some very common sense things, just different vestibular or auditory or proprioceptive systems. And there is no involvement of highly expensive equipment. You're using your activities and your equipment of daily living. All you've got to keep in mind is, before you start a sensory stimulation program, you want to do some good homework. And what I mean by that is, you're having a brief assessment with the patient's family, because you want to, you want to know the patient's likes and dislikes from across the whole lifespan of that patient, in terms of food, in terms of people, in terms of entertainment, social life, hobbies, a proper list of what the patient likes and what the patient dislikes. And one very important factor to keep in mind before we start sensory stimulation is, say for example, a case of suicide, when you gradually introduce what we call visual stimuli, so you get, the, get family members across the patient, you want to make sure that the person who's responsible for putting that patient in a coma state, coma state is, is not coming across anywhere near in that earlier stages. So this is where there has to be a very good homework. Say, for example, if I was the reason that person is in coma, you shouldn't allow me in front of the patient at any point unless the patient has returned back home. If you do that, you, you're introducing what we call a noxious stimuli to that patient. And unfortunately, no matter how hard you work, you, you're your chances are getting dimmer and dimmer because the patient is absolutely furious with you. The patient knows that this person was the result. He ended up in coma and you're introducing that person at the first point of contact. So make sure you do some thorough homework and do not rush into going for a sensory stimulation program. Now, like I mentioned at a basic level, you know you're working on your four, four or five sensory domains and we all have a wide range of sort of equipment or, or common sense or what we call 
abilities to to you know play around of what we want to stimulate but at a higher level you want to start thinking as to what you want to introduce in terms of sensory stimulation how you want to introduce that and more importantly what effect is it having on the brain because we just do not want to introduce all the stimuli together and start arousing the patient this is where you need to start sort of differentiating and labeling your sensory programs so what you want to make sure is you want to use a term called sensory modulation so you want to make sure the stimulus is right someone might need what we call a very high level of stimuli to arouse and the other end you might need someone to calm down so you want to introduce calming strategies as opposed to more of arousal strategies so you you need to modulate your sensory program across these two wide wide sort of domains whenever you do that you want to make sure you're trying to create a balance between the excitatory and the inhibitory mechanisms this should be at the back of your mind so you're not introducing something which excites the patient too much and there's no inhibitory response or your program is too low in a stimuli that it is just inhibiting the responses and not creating any excitatory response try and get a balance easier said than done very difficult but comes with practice and eventually what you're looking for is activating the limbic system process so there is a big element of emotional sort of pattern across coma stimulation program so you want to make sure that eventually whatever you do makes sense in terms of giving sufficient arousal to the limbic system you do not want to rush into things and then there are key elements of what we call cog cognitive processing which i will talk in detail and the process of habituation is everyone okay so far good okay how are we doing with time okay not bad another very quick sort of uh, stimulation uh, program that that we commonly use is the median nerve stimulation program now this is a highly specialized area because initially you're looking at uh, doing nerve conduction and emg studies to find out velocities and and the muscle firing potential of of that particular nerve and then depending on on the response you have you start stimulating the median nerve but there is strong evidence that stimulation of the median nerve improves what we call cortical processing information the reason we do that is the median nerve has a slightly larger cortical representation in the brain compared to other nerves and as we know as we as we come across a basic sensory physiology sensory homunculus so smaller areas of our body have the larger representation in the brain so you want to stimulate the smaller areas to get larger areas of the brain fired up speed up recovery process and along with that you also have projection pathways between the thalamus and the cortex for the median nerves so basically you're you're improving fine coordination skills grasp release and all of those activities by stimulating the median nerve so very important element of median nerve stimulation at at a basic level if you do not have the resources to do the emg and the ncv you want to make sure the patient is medically stable and there is some amount of response to the median nerve stimulation just learn up your motor points where you can stimulate the median nerve and start off at a very low intensity and gradually work your way through up there is there is no limitation or restriction that if you do not have detail of ncv or or emg studies you cannot do this but you have to be careful you cannot introduce a very large amount of electrical stimulation straight away for this right now i'm going to spend the rest of this session introducing this particular element of coma stimulation what we call cognitive rehab this is an area i i enjoy working with and spend a lot of time as i mentioned before with movement with action there has to be an element of cognition otherwise you're not doing justice to the patient and the reason i say that is following a neurological insult the internal patchwork is now disturbed so the external reality will be affected depending on the insult and depending on the reality you have to start working your physio rehab program 
and this this plays important plays an important role not from just the cognitive element but what you plan from a physical rehab point of view so if the patient has a very intense patch work you start working at what we call a new reality program you know that the previous recovery will never happen now so you start working towards a new program if the patch work is reasonable then you know that okay i can start working towards what we call compromised elements and if the patient is lucky the, the insult is not that great there are very little patches you start working towards what we call normality so these are the three phases your your rehab should fall into either a completely new pattern functional recovery either a compromised recovery or a near normal recovery very important for us to understand that of the wide range of cognitive domains four main important ones your attention and concentration levels your ability to process information memory and executive functioning they all work unfortunately hand in hand so if one is affected there will be a knockdown effect on the other depending on the part of the brain injured the knockdown effect will vary but it is very important that you address all of these elements when you start preparing your rehab program at, at a very sort of basic understanding level you you start for example some some mobility exercises with with your client for the half an hour session the client is is following you because it is doing what is more of a visual sort of feedback so because initial stage you're doing more of a passive approach the client is happy because he is not doing much work because there is minimal amount of information that he is processing because all you are doing is passive stuff to him so he has nothing to do and it's not sort of processing any information and you expect some sort of information to be retained when you see the patient the next day you see the patient the next day patient has no clue what's happening so you get frustrated as a therapist the patient is already frustrated so if there was a slight sort of slowing approach and had you paid attention that okay this patient is not able to process information let me work on that first and then start moving on to more sort of you know movement therapy because that's physio we want to rush mobility balance get them walking get them home fine you know that that is good but you want to make sure you start realizing that an element of cognition has to play otherwise things can get not not get uh, very very good in terms of re recovery okay to try and explain this this particular area of of coma stimulation uh, i'll present a case and uh, show you a video of of an assessment and a, and a therapy session that i've done so that will make make more sense other than just talking on on all of the stuff so we had a 67 year old female lady head injury when she fell off from a bike rushed into the ane initially gcs score of 11 which is reasonably good pupils equal and reactive to light so good sort of optic nerve you know responses as well but there was some amount of focal neurological signs of meningeal irritation so neck stiffness and and headache so probably before rushing into investigation that the back of the mind you start thinking could be a case of subdural hematoma ha happened here because of the head injury and the only medical history that she had was hypertension otherwise fit and fine no other positive positive history so as as part of the initial uh, management protocol the consultants did what we call a cerebral mri and uh, they found out mass occupying lesion somewhere near the brain stem it's difficult to appreciate here but but this is what what they found out so after the patient was stabilized medically they did a ct scan and found out there was a meningioma and the size and the and the staging was quite severe so it was decided to remove that straight away work work on craniotomy and and get the meningioma removed now you can see that uh, picture on on the screen it's a, it's a bit difficult to appreciate without actually seeing the whole brain but if you can just sort of 
recover your brain anatomy, the circle of Willis, the involvement was such that as, as soon as the vertebral arteries, they sort of bifurcate into the posterior communicating arteries, the, the meningioma was sitting right on top there. So the involvement of the brain stem was, was at high risk. So you had your vertebral basal arteries being affected. And at the same time, going further up the circle of pillars, your posterior communicating arteries being affected. So it, it, it was a tricky sort of a case to manage, but uh, surgeons managed that and then started the, the recovery process for that patient. So like I mentioned, acute stage, you, you did your positioning. Once the patient was sufficiently alert, we started getting her on a tilt table to promote what we call more of proprioceptive and kinesthetic information. These two are very important. Whenever your patient is stable, medically stable, and you have the right resources, you want to make sure you start promoting some element of weight bearing straight away. These two sensory systems will play a major role in then sort of tuning up your other final sensory systems of what we call auditory visual. Because as, as, as physios, eventually you want to make sure the patient is walking. So for argument's sake, I might take it that if the vestibular system or the visual system is severely compromised, the patient will still walk, if you know what I mean, because the weight bearing processes have been developed. So you want to make sure you start introducing this very early. So this is, this is the recovery stage. We started off with a tilt table. And initially, this was as little as 10 to 15 seconds. That's it, not, not more than that. 15 seconds of a gradual tilt over. The feet are supported on the pillow, so the, the patient is now starting to get what we call the feedback processes. Kinesthesia, proprioceptive, very important. Now this lasted for around six to eight weeks in a combination of what we call the supported standing. So we were just sort of focusing on, on proprioceptive kinesthesia. Initially tilt table, later on a standing frame, supported standing frame. Weight bearing. If, if you can have a look here, her feet are completely supported against the bed and, and she's leaning. But as the machine goes up, you start pulling the patient further up. So they're more of in that alert position. They're fully supported so they do not feel unsecured. Easier said than done when you start doing this, this scream and scream and scream. So very difficult stage. So these two stages lasted for roughly six to eight weeks. So you can see it is, it's not, not an easy process to start working on a coma rehab uh, patient. Moving on further, after that, we started what we call supported walking. I wouldn't actually call this supported walking. It was more of further weight bearing promotion. Now, if you just sort of compare the previous two slides here in terms of you know, body mass as well. Initially, this when this was the acute stage, hands and limbs quite swollen up. Gradually, you see the amount of muscle atrophy there, especially the hands and the feet. Major bulk muscles. So you can imagine the amount of muscle memory that's that's been lost. So on a normal basis, you would start working on strengthening exercises at a later stage, but you want to keep this in the back of your mind that is a patient prepared to take that weight without that necessary supporting devices? When, when you use an equipment like this, the amount of strength required from the person physically is, is 10 to 15% only. 80% of the work is done by the machine. So you're building an element of confidence in the patient. And then eventually working on a pulpit frame, this is after a good two to three months. Okay. Six months later, patient medically stable. Unfortunately, despite the best efforts we made in terms of mobility, all she could manage was step transfers only. So, you know, just getting up from the bed, using that pulpit frame to go to the toilet or back and, and nothing more than that. The reason for that was there was severe cognitive impairments across all major cognitive domains. 
So she couldn't understand or process information to make sense, to have that memory. So, so no matter, even if you have two or three sessions every day of mobility, the, the, the moment you look for a feedback and the moment you look for an automatic response, she just wouldn't walk. She wouldn't feel secure. She would say no. Almost done. So that's that's us for this particular you know brief session on this. Just key points to keep in mind. For more patients, you want to make sure you're doing a continuous assessment, constant adaptation, having a flexible approach, and my my bet on action and cognition they have to go hand in hand so that that will optimize results for us rather than just focusing on the movement element alone thank you very much uh, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to thank uh, ganveen ma'am in, in particular uh, it's been around uh, 15 years since i last left uh, the institute and uh, learned a lot of stuff uh, from Ganveen Ma'am in particular from a neuro perspective and other professors uh, uh, in, in our college. So I'm lucky I got this opportunity to share some of the knowledge that I've learned uh, in, this, in these years. And, and of course, the organizing committee, thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. So let's, uh, we'll be going for the question sessions right now. We have few questions for the same. The first question is how to differentiate clinically between, uh, between coma and locked in syndrome. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So for the question sessions, so did you hear the question? The first question is how to differentiate clinically between coma and locked in syndrome. Okay. I'll, I'll bring this slide across if you. Oh, very, very basic understanding. You want to make sure that the patient is either conscious or unconscious. And this is where you start differentiating it. So people with locked in syndrome will present more of what we call a decerebrate, decorticate sort of uh, presentation. And, and majority of them will have what we call an element of consciousness with them. In terms of brainstem involvement, what will be presented in a locked in syndrome will be slightly different compared to a, a, a comatose patient. So for a comatose patient, the bilateral cerebral hemisphere involvement is, is for sure. For a locked syndrome patient, there tends to be a unilateral involvement at times. And hence, you see some amount of a, a variable movement pattern in those patients. So this helps you sort of distinguish between, between the two. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the other question is, uh, why we can't perform the dose reflex alone? And if it is done alone, what will be the consequences? The, the reason I say that is uh, for specific cases of, for example, spinal cord injury that has led to this particular brainstem herniation process and the patient is in coma, you could be doing further damage because it's, it is done in a slightly vigorous manner you, you're holding your head and you're moving it across in one particular direction so if the if the patient is someone with a spinal cord injury the chances are you're damaging it more and and like i mentioned it is a very important vital sign so you want to make sure as as a physio or the clinician you see that for sure because that that brings in a lot of other cranial nerve uh, lesions but the amount of damage it can do if you do it alone is, is irreparable. So you want to make sure you play a safe game just from that point of view. The blame shouldn't come on you. Because like I said, diagnosing someone with coma is not our job. Our job is rehab. And the dose reflex, once it gives you a positive sign, that means there's brainstem herniation. 
towards towards Bhim Sen Mahani Asian. So you want to make sure you play a safe game and you're not doing something that will further aggravate that. Because majority of patients, what 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 will be done at some stages if there are signs of meningeal irritation, you will do what we call a lumbar puncture. Now, if the lumbar puncture has been done, say for example today, and you start mobilizing the patient the very next day, you are then sort of increasing the chances of the ICP being raised up again. That will lead to further sort of what what we call fissure of brainstem herniation, and you're inviting more trouble. So. As much as they're important, hence I say, under the supervision of a senior neurology registrar or a consultant, they are the experts. If something goes wrong, you're you're, you're not responsible for that. In in a, in a in a nice way, you know, I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't be doing it, but if your consultant allows you to do that, go for it. Is that okay? Hello. I think we've lost Ankita there. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, sir. So next question. Uh, if there is no recovery in a coma patients after two months, how to proceed with the rehab? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Can I repeat this question? No, I, I, I've got the question. I think your mainstay is then working towards positioning. And the reason the patient is not recovering is because the brainstem involvement is so severe that it is more of a respiratory compromise as opposed to the brain recovering in its, in its functional capacity. So you're, you're, you're working towards maintenance of what we call more of a palliative approach. So all you're doing is positioning and passive movements to preserve that particular state of that patient. Because if you're reaching towards the end of the two month mark and there is no recovery, although case is ready, you're now sort of suspecting more of a dip down in that patient. So it is more towards a vegetative state as opposed to the patient now going to come back into a minimally sort of recovery conscious state. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Ankita, switch on your mic. Do you have any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so it was how to decide the yes, sir. 
so how to decide at the cognitive level when to add the next level of complexity is for the patient and is there any scale to assess it this is this is a bit tricky to answer here in in terms of uh, what scales are available and what level to decide the answer is it is in itself that there are a lot of cognitive scales and when you when you do a proper cognitive rehab i wouldn't say a degree but more of a cognitive rehab sort of strategy there are scales in those. now when you when you do a scale the good point of these scales is they work as both as a treatment option as well as a, a prognostic option so uh, all all those different four domains that i mentioned attention visual perception memory executive function there are different scales and a different activities to do so when a person progresses gets a higher score you automatically know that you start introducing more complex activities okay thank you so much sir thank you now Ankita, your mic is mute. I cannot hear anything. Am I audible, sir? Now, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. That that's it for the question and the answers. I, Dr. Ankita Talreja, thank you on behalf of IP Women Cells Pune for accepting our request and made time for the webinar. Thank you, Dr. I'll just add up. It's it's been an absolute yes. <laughs> I think we're losing out of connectivity, but like I mentioned before, an absolute pleasure for me. More of an opportunity to share some knowledge that I learned uh, throughout these years, and uh, hopefully, it's a bit difficult to explain things and, and show through a web. If if things permit, and I get an opportunity. I would love to. You know, come across uh, in an ICU setting somewhere and show you those uh, sliding techniques, uh, simulation programs, and that that makes a whole lot of difference as opposed to just sort of uh, sitting in front of the camera here and listening. Uh, I'm sure half of you must have gone to sleep uh, when I start this simulation program. So. Uh, Okay, thank you so much, sir. At the end, I would like to thank IIP Women Cell Maharashtra, Dr. Sanjeev Sah, sir, Dr. Ruchi, ma'am, Dr. Pooja Kamle, Dr. Suvarna Ganvir, ma'am, State Coordinator, Dr. Snehal Patel, ma'am, Uttara Mohan, ma'am, Dr. Priya, Dr. Nirali, for giving us the opportunity and throughout the guidance for uh, for conducting the webinar and continuing the source of learning in the lockdown. Thank you, everyone. So I have put the feedback form in the chat box. I request all the participants to fill the the feedback form. Thank you so much, sir, for being there and conducting the webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Stay at home. You too, sir.